today we turn to a new argument and the last that we'll be surveying in our class. And this is the ontological argument for God's existence. And we have a handout available for this. If you need it, raise your hand and uh, Marion will get a handout to you forthwith. In the year 1078, a Benedictine monk by the name of Anselm, who later became the Archbishop of Canterbury, formulated a new and bold argument for the existence of God, which has now fascinated philosophers for a millennium. A year earlier, in 1077, Anselm had finished writing a treatise called the Monologium, in which he presented uh, cosmological and moral arguments for God's existence. But Anselm was dissatisfied with the complexity of the case for theism that he had developed, and he wanted to find a single argument which would prove that God, with all of his attributes, in all of his greatness, exists. And he had pretty much given up on the task when he came upon the definition of God. Ah, thank you, Marian. The definition of God in Latin as aliquid quo nihil maius. Cogitare posit. The Latin is so great. See, you can learn this phrase and impress your friends when they ask you for a definition of God. Aliquid quo nihil maius cogitare posit. That is to say, God is something than which nothing greater can be conceived. Or in more idiomatic English, God is the greatest conceivable being. And Anselm argued that once uh, in his, uh, his treatise then that followed, the Proslogium, that once you understand the definition of God, once you understand what God is, then you, if you've really understood it, will see that God must exist. Because if God did not exist, he would not be the greatest conceivable being. A greatest conceivable being must be an existent being. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the greatest. So God's existence is inconceivable for anybody who really understands the word God and understands what God is. And Anselm says that's why Psalm 14.1 says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Because if that person really understood the word God, then he would see that God must exist. And so he's a fool for saying that the greatest conceivable being does not exist. Now, Anselm's argument came to be known as the ontological argument. which is from the Greek word antos, meaning being. It went on to assume a variety of different forms and has been defended by some of the greatest uh, thinkers in the history of philosophy. Uh, for example, uh, John Dun Scotus, René Descartes, Benedict de Spinoza, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, and so on. What is the common thread? in all of these different versions of the argument that unites them and makes them ontological arguments. 
Well, I think the common thread among these various ontological arguments is that they all try to deduce the existence of God from the very concept of God, together with some uh, necessary truths. Proponents of the ontological argument in its various forms maintain that once we understand what God is, once you have an adequate conception of God, uh, whether the greatest conceivable being or the most perfect being or the most real being, then we will see that such a being must, in fact, exist. Now, this argument uh, has tended to sharply polarize philosophers. For example, the 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer characterized the ontological argument as a charming joke. And that opinion is certainly shared by many other philosophers today. On the other hand, um, the argument has been uh, taken very seriously and, in fact, defended as sound by quite a number of 20th century philosophers who are of some prominence as well. Um, notably, Norman Malcolm, Charles Hartshorn, and Alvin Plantinga. Since Plantinga's version of the argument is, I think, the most sophisticated and the most recent development of the argument, um, we'll use it as the springboard for our discussion of the ontological argument. Now, in Plantinga's version of the argument, he appropriates the insight of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz that the ontological argument assumes that the concept of God is possible. That is to say, the argument assumes that the concept God, or the greatest conceivable being, is a coherent concept. Or, uh, using the semantics of possible worlds, it assumes that there is a possible world in which God exists. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with the uh, semantics of possible worlds, let me just say a word of explanation about this, lest we be misled. When we talk about possible worlds, we do not mean planets or even other universes. Rather, a possible world is simply a maximal description of reality. It's a way reality might be. I think the easiest way to think about a possible world is as a huge conjunction of propositions, P and Q and R and S um, and so on. And these individual conjuncts, P, Q, R, S, are propositions which um, can be true or false. And a possible world is a conjunction which comprises um, every proposition or its contradictory, so that it yields a maximal description of reality. Nothing is left out of such a description. And by negating different conjuncts or propositions, we can arrive at different possible worlds. So, for example, we could call W1 um, this description of the world, P and Q and R and S. Um, but another description of the world would be W2, and that might be P and not Q and uh, R and not S and so forth. Uh, W3 would be another possible world. And this might be not P and Q and 
not R and S and so forth. Or W4, which could be not P and not Q and R and not S. These would uh, continue uh, being the range of possible worlds. Only one of these descriptions will be comprised of propositions uh, or conjuncts, all of which are true, and so is the true description of the way reality actually is. And that description we will dignify by saying it is the possible, or it is the actual world. So one of these will have all true conjuncts, and that will be the actual world. Now, let me pause at this point and ask if there's any question of a comprehension type nature about what possible worlds are. Okay, this has always been the uh, argument for God that I've had the hardest time wrapping my head around, so I just want to be sure that I'm clear so far. So this is different than the multi-world or um, multi-world hypo hypothesis because we're not saying each of these are actual worlds out there somewhere. We're saying we're talking about one single actual world, and these are all the different ways it could have been, yes. although only one of them is correct. So it's completely different than the multi-world. Right. This is different than the multiverse, multiverse. hypothesis or the many worlds hypothesis right. in okay. cosmology or quantum physics. Here, as I say, just think of these worlds as descriptions, just big conjunctions like uh, Ben Jones exists, Cindy Fox exists, Bryant Wright exists, William Craig exists. That's all this is. It's just a big description, and the description that is true is the actual world. Okay, okay. I, I get yeah. That. Taylor? Uh, so in order to get rid of a possible world as a possible world, is the only way that we can do that to uh, find a contradiction within? Uh... That's a good question, and I'll say something about that in a minute. These propositions obviously have to be compossible. They have to be able to both be true in the same world, right? Otherwise, that's an impossible world, so that's not a possible world. But they also need to be possible in and of themselves. The proposition itself needs to be possible. And I'll say something about that in a moment. So um, you need to have both each conjunct being possible in itself, and then you need their combination to be possible to be a possible world as well. Brad? That's exactly what I was, I was going to ask. What do you mean by possible? What are the yeah. underlying assumptions of yes. possible? Okay, Th this is a really good question, and it's probably impossible to define it. Um, <laughs> no, you can't use that. Because it's a sort of primitive concept, but the idea would be actualizable or realizable. This is something that really could exist, really could be actual. Given, Does that help? Given, given maybe the laws of physics of this no no not not the laws of physics that? that would okay Brad good 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 question there are different types of modality aren't there and one of these would be what we might call physical modality and Brad says that something would be physically possible if it's consistent with the laws of nature and be physically impossible um, if it contradicts the laws of nature. But that's a fairly narrow kind of modality. There are things which might not be physically possible, but they're still logically possible. And so the kind of modality that is at play here, Brad, is again this sort of ill-defined type of modality called broadly logical modality. So we're talking about broadly logical possibility and necessity. And again, what does one mean by that? One means that something is broadly logically possible if it's actualizable or realizable. If it could really be real, then that will be something that's broadly logically possible. Sometimes this is called metaphysical possibility and necessity. That's another label 
but it's still the same idea, is that it's something that's realizable. As you will probably remember, I've never thought this was a very good argument. <laughs> One of the busy, and we'll get down to, the, I guess my core complaint is that other so-called possible worlds are not possible, okay? There's only one world possible, and that's this one. You, the only way you could get another world would be to get a creator, as a theist, you and I, to do that. Well, to try to get God to make another possible world, say that had an orange sky instead of a blue sky, or which one of us didn't exist, it did exist, I would say is imaginative and fanciful. In other words, just because you can imagine, which is what these philosophers are doing, these other worlds, doesn't mean there's any way that they, any other world but this one could possibly be a reality. So I, that's why I would never evoke yeah, this argument. We, we've, we've been around this block before, Bob, uh, <laughs> and I think you, you, you just don't get it uh, in terms of what, what you're expressing is a kind of logical fatalism where everything that is true is necessarily true, um, and there are no possibilities. So on your view, it's impossible, for example, that God might have refrained from creating the world. Or it's impossible that um, Peter not deny Christ three times. Or it's impossible that the second person of the Trinity take on a human nature one second later than he did in Mary's womb. And those just seem to be utterly implausible sorts of assertions. Um, and would really deny God's freedom. It would mean that God has no logical possibilities either. So as long as we're not conce conceiving of these things as actual worlds someplace, but simply as ways the world could have been, surely there are contingencies, there are possibilities, and, and some of these concern God himself. And if, if you deny that, you land in a kind of logical fatalism even concerning God, where everything that happens, happens necessarily. And that, to me, just seems obviously mistaken, and also theologically pernicious. Right. Well, those, it would make evil necessary, for yeah. example. Well, those are not my attitudes, and I don't think that they necessarily flow from, from my position. I don't see how that flows, how a, a logical fatalism flows well, from But, from Bob, you attitude. said there, there's only one logically possible world, this one. Well, now, so, I don't know what you mean by logically possible. Right. Logic see, that's why I said logic I Logic is you, of this world, so. <laughs> yeah, see, I, that's why I said I don't think you, you right. get it here. The, the idea is, as I said to Brad, that we're talking here about something that's realizable, actualizable. This reality could be that way. Well, and freedom on God's part would surely necessitate well, of course, that there are other... My God has the freedom to create any world he wanted, but the fact is he did not. That's what I'm saying. And, and, and any of these other words, he did not do that for yeah. various reasons known only to him and his sovereignty. He chose not to do right. that. Now, right. I can imagine, what if he did? What if he didn't? But see, that's fanciful to me and, and not really based in reality. These other worlds are not real. That's right but they are ways the world could have been. And I think you're, you're, you want to admit that. I mean, you want to say God has the freedom to do differently but and he, to have done differently. 